Your lecturer is Talithia Williams. Dr. Williams is an associate professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd College. She received a PhD in statistics from Rice University. Dr. Williams gave the popular TED Talk, Own Your Body's Data, and is co-host of the PBS series, Nova Wonders. She received the Mathematical Association of America's Henry L. Alder Award for Distinguished Teaching by a beginning college or a university mathematics faculty member. Her professional experiences include conducting research for NASA, the National Security Agency, and the World Health Organization. As a statistician, I'm trained to look at decision making in terms of data. What evidence do we have to back up our choices? Let me share an example with you. My husband Donald and I were pregnant with our third child, and we were at 41 and a half weeks. Now, we went to the hospital for just a routine stress test, but the doctor decided that we needed to be induced to artificially begin the labor process. Now, let me tell you, we had been induced with our first son and it was not a smooth process. So if at all possible, we wanted to avoid induction. And when I asked this doctor on call, who'd never seen me before, why he thought induction was best, his response boiled down to saying, well, I think you're overdue. Now, what you may not know is that pregnancy due dates are calculated, assuming a woman has a 28 day cycle. But like most women, my cycle length varies. Sometimes it's 26 days, other times it's 39 days. And I had been collecting the data to prove it. I had been taking my waking body temperature daily for the previous six years. So nothing fancy here, but look at this sample. This is an actual chart that we would use to record my daily waking temperatures. Now, there's nothing super fancy here, but we did have all of this data that we could now use to get a more precise estimate of my true due date. In fact, my due date that I calculated from my data was off from the due date that the doctor had. And so we decided not to be induced that day. And we naturally went into labor the very next day. Now, this is what it's like to be statistically literate, to understand data like a statistician. It's more than just reciting facts from the past. I mean, to truly appreciate statistical information, we have to understand the language of statistics, the assumptions of statistics, and how do we reason in the face of uncertainty? In effect, we've got to become masters of the art of learning from data, which has two sides. Accurately describing and summarizing the data we have, and then going beyond the data we have. How do we make inferences about data that we don't have? Well, statistics is both. It's descriptive and it's inferential. All right, so what is statistics formally? It's this. It's a branch of mathematics, but it's also a science, much like biology or physics. It involves collecting data, analyzing data, working with it, interpreting data, how do we reach conclusions, and then presenting that data. So again, think of statistics as a way to get information, to get knowledge from data. Now, it's a great toolkit, but it's so much more than that. It is a powerful framework for thinking, for reaching insights and solving different problems. So we start with quantitative data. Quantitative data, they're always numbers. Often it's the result of measuring some characteristic about a population, like heights or weights or pulse rates or the number of people living in your town. Now, quantitative data is either discrete or continuous. Discrete data take on only certain values, certain numerical values like one or three 
or 17. While continuous data, well, they can take on any value along an interval of numbers. And the data is measured on a continuous scale. Now, qualitative variables, these are generally described by words or letters. So for instance, uh, hair color. Hair color might be black or dark brown or light brown or blonde or gray or red. Or things like blood type, that's a qualitative variable. Maybe you're AB positive or O negative. We also call these categorical variables because the data tends to appear in different categories. Let's do an example. There was an experiment some years ago that recorded how much chickens grew when they were given different types of feed. So newly hatched chicks were randomly put into six groups and each group was given a different feed supplement. Now here's the total number of chicks that were placed in each of the groups. And now notice after six weeks, their weights were recorded. And here you see their individual weights. The purpose here was to determine which feed, if any, led to the heaviest chickens. I might wanna buy one of those heavy ones. So here are two variables. We've got weight. Weight is a continuous quantitative variable. It gives us the chicken weight. And the second one is feed. This is a categorical variable. It's qualitative. It gives us the feed type. So check out this plot. Here I've labeled for you that the feed type, which occurs along the x-axis, is a categorical or qualitative variable, while the weight on the y-axis is continuous, is quantitative. Now, when we combine individual chicks from each feed, we get subtotals. And this allows us to see the average weight by feed. Notice here, chickens on diets that are in the first group and the last group turned out to be the heaviest. Now, these graphics, like all the graphics and analysis that we do throughout this course, are generated in a package called R, which I strongly encourage you to download for yourself. R is a free, open source set of tools that have become the world's leading statistical programming environment. It's used by everyone from beginning students to experts who need a statistical engine for big data projects. Now, statistics is about analyzing data, but not just any kind of data. Oh, no, no, no. As we move from description to inference, Statistics is about using a representative sample taken from a population. Let me say that one more time. Statistics is about a representative sample taken from a population. So how do we get a representative sample? Well, we take a random sample. Let's define that. A simple random sample is a subset of the population where each member of the subset has an equal probability of being chosen. So based on the sample, we try to generalize about the entire population, and that's known as statistical inference. So this is why it's so important that the sample is representative of the population. Now, as we begin to discuss samples and populations, we need a convenient way to refer to them. And here's the notation that we use. So for population parameters, we denote the population mean by the Greek letter mu. And for sample parameters or sample statistics, we would denote our sample statistics by say X bar. This would be our sample mean. Now, we need to extract basic information from the sample. And so we do that through the summary statistics. This is gonna help us describe some of that basic information. And perhaps most basic is the mean value or just the average, because that always sort of tells us where a data set is grounded, where is the center of that data. So that's typically the first thing that we look for. All right, let's go back to our code. We find the mean by adding all of our data points and dividing by the total number. So here's the weights of chicks that were on the horse bean feed. 
In R, we've set our x variable equal to those data points. So 179 was the first value, 160 the second weight. And now I want to sum that. So sum of x gives me a sum. And if I take that sum, which in this case is 1,602, and divide it by the total number of points, 10, I get the mean of x, 160.2. Now, R also has a built-in mean function. You don't have to go typing out the mean every time you need it. Conveniently, it's called mean. And so I can also apply that to my X and notice those values match up perfectly. Now, take a moment here and look at those colors because I want to make sure you're able to follow along with the code that we use in every lecture. So you'll notice that in this course, the input code typically appears as yellow and the output code, it shows up as green. Now, when we're thinking about where the center of the data is located, the median is another way to measure center. You can think of the median as, uh, as the middle value, right? Although it doesn't actually have to be one of the observed values. So to find the median, here's what we do. We order our data from smallest to largest, and we're going to locate the number that splits the data into two equal parts. Let's do that in R. Here's our data set, but notice we first have to sort it. So sort of X allows us to sort that data set. So now it's sorted from least to greatest. Now, since our data set has 10 values, two of those values are both located at the center, 143 and 160 at locations five and six. And so we take the average of those values to get a median of 151.5. Now the median is the number that separates ordered data into halves. Half the values are the same size or smaller than the median, and half the values are the same size or larger than the median. Suppose though, what if our data set had 11 values? Well then, the median would actually be equal to the number located smack dab in the middle. In this case, in location six, when the data is ordered. In fact, let's do that in R. Let's add a weight of a 500 ounce chicken to our value. Now that is one fat chicken. Now check out the code we used to do that. We've just added 500 to our X vector. We've sorted it again. And then you see where that 500 ounce chicken shows up in our data. So now the median is 160 ounces. This is the middle value. But notice that the mean of this data changes to 191.1 approximately. So the median is generally a better measure of the center when your data has extreme values or outliers. So data for things like income or wealth or real estate, these often include high-end outliers that affect the mean. For instance, in 2007, pre-tax family income in the United States calculated as a mean was over 90,000, but the median was a little over 50,000. So the median is not affected by extreme values. So if your mean is far away from the median, that's a hint that the median might actually be better representative of your data. Now we can use R to generate summary statistics directly for us. Let's try it on the chick weights data set that we've been working with. So we use this command summary of chick weights, which is our data set. Now summary followed by a parentheses is a command. And the word inside of that parentheses is the name of the data set. This is what we want to take the summary of. So notice here, the summary output gives us the mean and the median of the weight data, along with the minimum and the maximum values and the first and third quartiles. Now for feed, we get a summary of how many chicks are in each group. Now, once we know where our data is centered, we then want to understand sort of how spread out our, our values are. Now, one way is to calculate how far each individual value is from the center of the data. 
If our data is centered on the mean, then we can calculate a distance from there. And so each of these distances we call a deviation. Check this out. So here's our data x. And we want to take x and subtract the mean of x. So in this case, let's start with the first value, 179 minus the mean of x gives us 18.8. .8. So that's our first deviation. The second one, 160 minus the mean of x, likewise, gives us negative 0.02. So we continue in this fashion to get all of the deviations for our data. Now, we could add those up. But if we did, we'd just get a sum of zero. We could also add the absolute value of all of those deviations and average that to get a mean absolute value. We do that in R with the command mad open parentheses. But the mean gives much more weight to outliers. So when we're measuring the spread from the mean, we usually want to give weight to these outlying values. And we do that by looking at the sum of the square of the deviations, and we divide that by the total number of data values minus one, n minus one. Now that minus one is because the mean value has no deviation from itself, so we account for that. Here's how we calculate the variance of our data. We start with that first point, 179, minus the mean, 160.2, and we square it. And we do that for every point in our data. And then we divide by n minus 1, or 10 minus 1. Notice, when we take those differences and square them and divide by 9, we get a variance of 1,491.96. Now, the variance is in squared units. And it doesn't have the same units as our original data. So to get back to our original units, we take the square root, and we call that the standard deviation. Now, the standard deviation measures the spread in the same units as our data. And we denote standard deviation of a sample by the letter S, and the standard deviation of a population by sigma squared. All right, pop quiz. Let's go back to our notation. Remember those population parameters, so that's the parameters that we use to describe the entire population, are those Greek letters, mu for the population mean, and now sigma squared for the population variance. And when we get to the sample, our sample statistics, well, we use x bar for the sample mean and s squared for the sample variance. Now, when this sample standard deviation is zero, that means there's no spread in the data, and the data values are exactly equal to each other. When it's greater than zero, but small, well, then the data values are mostly close together. And when it's much, much greater than zero, the data values are very spread out about the mean. So outliers can make our S very large. Now, the standard deviation, again, is measuring how far our data is from the mean. And the mean and the standard deviation are often used to display a, a bell-shaped curve. Here's how we'd calculate that in R. Let's define x bar as the mean of x. And so we're going to take the sum, x minus its mean, quantity squared, divided by n minus 1. So that's the length of x is n minus 1. Notice we get a variance that matches what we calculated before. Now when we take the square root of that, that gives us the standard deviation, or s, approximately 38.6. But what if our data is not evenly spread out about the mean? Well, that is called skewness. And what do we do when data is highly skewed? Right, we use the median. And a common statistical graph for showing the spread of our data around the median is a box plot. A box plot is a graphical display of the concentration of our data centered at the median.
So BoxPox, they, they show us the visual spread of our data values. It gives us the smallest, the first quartile, the median, the third quartile, and the largest value. Now quartiles are numbers that separate the data into quarters. So like the median, quartiles may be located on a data point or between two data points. Now to find the quartiles, we first find the median, which is the second quartile. The first quartile is the middle value of the lower half of the data. And the third quartile is the middle value of the upper half of the data. All right, for illustration, let's look again at the chick, chick weight data. Here we've sorted our values. Notice the lower half of the data is 108 through 143. And the middle value of the lower half is 136. So one fourth of the values are less than or equal to 136. And three fourths of all the values are greater than 136. Look at the upper half. The upper half goes from 160 to 227. And the middle value here is 179. And this represents the third quartile. Now box plots are a vertical rectangular box and two vertical whiskers that extend from the ends of the box to the smallest and the largest data values that aren't outliers. Now, if we have outlier values, if they exist, they actually get marked as points above or below those endpoints. So check this out. The smallest and the largest non-outlier data values are labeled at the endpoints of the axis. Here you see the first quartile, which marks the lower end of the box, and the third quartile marks the upper end of the box. And the central 50% of our data fall within those two quartiles. Now, compared to other statistical programs you might work with, like SAS or SPSS or Stata, R is a bit like Wikipedia. I mean, it's the online encyclopedia. This base version we'll use a lot. It's not so fancy. It might actually seem a little bit plain. But there are a lot more people actively using and contributing to R and plenty of R add-on packages that can get really fancy. Now, the other difference is that R is a programming environment, meaning that you tell the program what to do using lines of code instead of with things like pull-down menus. So you have a lot of power and flexibility. And moreover, R is a high level language, meaning the commands that you use are a lot like English. Now, it's possible to do some of the basic statistics that we'll cover in this course using a, a spreadsheet software, kind of like Excel. But the best way to learn R is just to hit the ground running with the basics don't wait until you get something in your spreadsheet that you can't quite handle. And an added bonus to beginning with R for this course is that many of the data sets that we'll use come bundled with R. Now here's an important note. When I say and show you R anywhere in this course, what I'm actually going to be doing is an implementation in R called R Studio. Now, compared to base R, RStudio has more functionality to help you generate files. And RStudio is built upon the base R language. So first, you're going to download R from www.r-project.org. And then you download RStudio, and you get this from www.rstudio.com. Now R has tons of packages that you can download and make it even more powerful. In fact, the first package I recommend is a package for learning R, which is called Swirl. So the code that you type or paste into R Studio looks like this if you want to get that Swirl package. install.packages, open parentheses, of swirled in quotation marks. 
Once you install the package, you have to use the library command to call that package out. So library of swirl. And then the command swirl with an open and closed parenthesis launches that package. And once you get swirl uploaded, there's a particular package for use inside of it that I recommend that you use for practicing R in between our lectures. And here it is. Now remember, statistics is learning by doing, not merely listening or watching. In fact, I find it beneficial for every 30 minutes of class instruction to spend at least another 30 minutes outside of class. Maybe you're working through additional problems on your own. And this is if you really want to master the material. Well, in any case, we always want to keep the big picture in mind, right? No matter what we end up doing in statistics, it's important to keep track of the statistical assumptions that are underlying what we're doing. And so even when we're merely um, describing and summarizing our data, when we're doing descriptive statistics. Part of what we're doing is checking to see which of our basic statistical assumptions in the data follow those, which of them meet our assumptions, and which of those assumptions don't follow that in the data. So checking data against our assumptions, it tells us what information can be drawn from the data. And now never forget, all data has uncertainty. I mean, that's why we need to understand probability. Probability provides us a foundation for statistical reasoning, and it's on the basis of samples. And so we use that probability theory to make inferences, to draw conclusions about our sample. We call this inferential statistics. Now, much of what happens in uh, more advanced statistics classes involves uh, relaxing and replacing some of these assumptions from beginning statistics. So assumptions like independence or linearity get relaxed in some of those advanced sessions. For example, if we have data like the data you see here, then the assumption that the data follows a line well, it clearly doesn't hold, but that's okay. We can transform the data perhaps using a logarithm, or we can replace lines with polynomial curves. And as you'll see, spatial data and time series data, they both abandon the assumption that data is independent. Now, in Bayesian statistics, we take an entirely different approach to inference. It's based less on the quantity of the current information and more on the quality of your prior information. Now, in emphasizing the uncertainty present in all data, it might seem like we're saying that nothing's really true, but that's not the case. We know a lot about what we don't know. In fact, we can even quantify the uncertainty. I'm 95% confident in this result, and 5% of the time, I'm wrong. Well, we're able to say so much about the uncertainty. And we never know everything. But in showing us how to say very precisely what we don't know, statistics makes it much easier to show how much we do know. And it points us towards what to learn next.